Good afternoon, I'm Matt Thurlow, Executive Director of the Decorative Arts Trust, and welcome to our August virtual tour, generally sponsored by our friends at Freeman's in Philadelphia. And we find ourselves today at the Wharton Eshrick House in Northern Chester County, just a few miles west of Valley Forge, uh, the important American Revolution historic site. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar at, of Eshrick's career, this will be an extraordinary deep dive into his incredibly diverse talents and perhaps the most uh, incredible expression of his creativity and the largest object we'll get to see today is the studio standing behind us, which was started in the uh, 1920s. And we have the great privilege of seeing the collection inside with three equally talented colleagues. <laughs> Uh, Julie Siglin, Executive Director of the Wharton Eshrick Museum. Um, Emily Zilber, who's Director of Curatorial Affairs and Strategic Partnerships for it. the Eshrick. <laughs> and then Tim Andriatis uh, from Freeman's, who you all may recognize from our recent panel discussion on the antiques business. So thank you all so much for creating this opportunity today. Uh, it really is an extraordinary and fabulous experience. And for those who haven't had a chance to I'm privileged to be here in person. I know you'll bring it alive for them as we walk through the house. So thank you. Thank you for having us. This is great. Welcome. Um, those of you who are not familiar with Wharton Escherich, um, he was from Philadelphia. Wharton was largely known as a furniture maker, as a woodworker, um, but he is a multifaceted person. Um, he was an artistic polymath and is credited with many more things than just furniture making and sculpture. He was a foundational figure, in fact, in, um, in American art history, in architecture. This site is a National Historic Landmark for architecture. Um, and he worked in many different media, including painting, including ceramics. Um, and he transitioned from two-dimensional art, starting out at Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, eventually finding his way to, to the media of furniture. So we'll meet some of his furniture inside. I just wanted to give you a very brief uh, biographical overview of his life before we, before we do that. Um, as I mentioned, he was from Philadelphia. His family uh, was from West Philadelphia. He was one of seven children. And his father worked in the banking industry. So there was an expectation that Wharton would go to school and he, he would follow in his father's footsteps. He would dress a certain way. He would behave a certain way. Um, and his life was sort of prescribed for him. When he came along, though, he knew from the very start that he wanted to be an artist. He carried a sketch pad with him everywhere he went instead of a little stuffed toy like a lot of kids did. He woke up in the pre-dawn hours and waited for the milkman. Uh, that horse stood still while the milkman was placing and retrieving uh, milk bottles on stoops, and he would sketch that horse. Uh, his mother complained there was never a blank piece of paper in the house. He would draw on the back of anything. She once provided him with a roll of toilet paper in a moment of exasperation when there was literally no more blank paper to be had in the house. So he was always making <laughs> art from the time he was a little guy. Um, they did not encourage his artistic pursuit. They didn't think he was going to make money at it and that it was going to be a stable career. They preferred that he went into a more, um, a more uh, upper class sort of uh, vocation like, like his father had done in, in banking or something where he would have a more uh, predictable income. But he persisted and he went into a school that had um, vocational training including some artwork and some smithing. Uh, and then from there he went to what's now the University of the Arts uh, and started studying painting. And then he got a scholarship to study with some very uh, well-known instructors including Cecilia Bowe, William Merritt Chase. William Merritt Chase came down and uh, I think from New York on Fridays yep. to teach <laughs> to teach Eshrick and declared him one of his favorite students. Um, so things were looking good for, for Eshrick to pursue this career as a painter. Um, so he quit about two months before the end of uh, this program for which he had gotten a scholarship, indicating that he felt he was being encouraged to paint like these instructors and he wanted to learn how to paint like so he left formal education and went into um, to industrial arts. In those days, these were well-paid jobs. He was doing illustrations, which is how things were marketed, how books were illustrated, and so mm -hmm. forth. Um, saved enough money to marry and start a family, which he did out here in Paoli, in a farmhouse about a tenth of a mile down the hill from where we are now. 
Um, he got into woodworking by uh, going to Fairhope, Alabama with his wife in the school year of 1919 to 1920. His wife, Letty, wanted to learn how to teach a style of education that was uh, becoming popular at the time, known as organic education. Everything in these days was organic as it is now. Um, this was uh, appealing to the Eshericks because they did not want their children. Um, there was one by 1916 and two more would come by 1926. They didn't want them to have the same type of education they had, which was very rooted in um, rote learning, mm -hmm. discipline. It wasn't, uh, didn't include the arts and it wasn't um, the kind of education they wanted, which was more human. Uh, so they went down to Fairhope, Alabama, and while they were down there and, and Letty's learning how to teach this style of education, Eshrick is painting. He's hoping to sell his paintings. He mounts a show. There's no frame shop in town. So by necessity, he goes and starts carving wooden frames to house his paintings. And when he does that, he starts to get some feedback that those frames are more interesting than the paintings <laughs> that we're holding. When they return back up here to Paoli after that school year, he starts to mess about with wood. Um, and I'll turn it over to Emily to talk a little bit more about what happens next with Wharton Eshrick and the material of wood. Sure, and we'll take a, we'll take, when we get head into the studio, we'll have a chance to see some of those frames and paintings and you'll get a chance to see some, some of these sort of transitions illustrated. Um, Eshrick then begins to take his um, career as a commercial illustrator and move that uh, into conversation with wood through block printing. So he's carving blocks, He's illustrating books. He's working with the Centaur Press, so sort of an avant-garde press in Philadelphia, to illustrate really beautiful, lavish books um, by, by folks like Walt Whitman. He's connecting with literary circles of the day. He's building this very eclectic life for himself in the late teens, early 1920s. Um, and at the same time, is anticipating that he will need more space than the very small studio that he had down the hill at Sunnycrest, the farmhouse, uh, which is now filled with children. <laughs> and he's using axes and, he's and using draw knives tools, and they're running around. And he around. needs um, uh, a little more space. And so we get Eshrick starting to build the studio that you see here um, in 1926. We like to think about the studio space really as a sort of biography in uh, in architectural form, right? Because it talks about Esh Eshrick's stylistic interests, his influences, what he was looking at, who he was at the moments that he built each portion of the studio. So there's sort of three separate dates um, uh, for when the studio, studio was developed, established. We have the, the sort of earliest portion of the studio at the far end there, that's uh, 1926, where he is really thinking about influences that range from uh, Pennsylvania vernacular architecture, so things like bank barns. Um, he's thinking about organic architecture through the lens of people like Frank Lloyd Wright. He's thinking about uh, the philosopher Rudolf Steiner's understanding of organic architecture, the idea that uh, there are sort of fundamental elemental forms in nature that can be best captured in material expression and those things uh, sort of give you a truest sense of, of artistry. Um, he's doing this without any training as an architect, which I think is, is, is a really wonderful and interesting common narrative for Eshrick, especially in this day where artists really are interdisciplinary and there is so much uh, uh, self-education going on after a BFA or an MFA program is completed, mm -hmm. if it's completed at all. So. Um, what that allows him is to integrate these influences in such a way that uh, he's doing things that maybe wouldn't have been so uh, <laughs> up and up if, if a, a, an a review board of architects were looking at them. But it gives this site such personality. It's one of the reasons we think about this as this autobiography in form, um, why we think about the studio in general as this kind of good Zomkinsberg. It's a total work of art. Everything is handcrafted. Um, from the, the actual overall concept of the space, um, the way that he is uh, picking the angles that we see the roofs go at, nothing is, uh, everything is intentional even though it might not appear to be. There's a sense of sort of whimsy and play with the geometry, um, the way that he's thinking about combining materials, um, down to 
the handles on the door to sort of get into the studio. So we've got the main studio space. We've got the silo uh, in the center here that was put on in, I'm sorry, the, the, put on in the 1940s. And then this incredible uh, painted element here from the 1960s, from 1966, where Escherich has actually done a sort of fresco of these remarkable colors. Um, you know, again, we think of Escherich as a woodworker, but really painting is this consistent thing that he comes back to over and over and over again in his life. It just may be on the facade of a building and not on the canvas. Um, I encourage you to come visit us. We're a sort of four seasons kind of place. So you're seeing us at the, the height of, of summer now with this beautiful lush greenery. If you came in a couple months at the peak of fall, the sort of mottled coloration on the exterior of the building really blends into the landscape. You have these sort of wonderful oranges and reds and colors uh, that really speak to, again, this initial impulse in the 1920s towards organic architecture, towards making a site that seems to come from the earth in, um, in really interesting and compelling ways. Escherich's life, his styles, there's change throughout, but there's also these cyclical moments. Sort of time for Escherich is, is, is kind of a spiral, right? He keeps coming back to things that were interesting to him uh, and revisiting them in new ways. So I'm wondering if we should head down and take a look at the studio. Until the building transitions to a home and studio around 1940, uh, this is the front door to Escherich's studio. The farmhouse is, is behind us down the hill. His commute is to literally walk through the woods, walk through the material uh, that is becoming his primary, primary material uh, to start his day through the door that we're about to walk through. Uh, he just has a fireplace to keep it, to keep it warm on the cooler days. He doesn't even have electricity at the start. There's an outhouse uh, bathroom. This is a workspace. When it transitions into a home in 1940, he puts that prismatic wood addition that Emily pointed out a little while ago. Another door uh, comes on on that side. Eventually, a driveway comes on from Horseshoe Trail. Mm -hmm. That becomes the front door. And then the 1966 edition houses more living spaces, including a formal kitchen, which really doesn't come on until he's uh, 79 years old, Yes, um, which I think says a lot about <laughs> what his priorities were in life. He would get around to cooking later. Right now, he's busy making art. Um, but we have had our first real site intervention uh, yes. this season with a contemporary artist, and I'd like Emily to tell you a little bit about yeah, that. Yeah, so going. so we're really interested in ways that we can think about bringing Eschrick's legacy front and center and linking it with contemporary artists and their practice. And so we've got this amazing uh, stone wall here, which looks incredibly sort of craggy and rustic in part because Eschrick is coming in and scooping out the, the, the sort of uh, mortar between the stones to make it that way. Um, friends of his would leave these objects um, and actually, sorry, I'm, we can span from there, but maybe if we, if we look right up there, <laughs> sorry about that. friends of his would leave these objects in, um, in the sort of crevices in the wall. We have some stones, natural materials, and, um, you know, a, a blessing of the pandemic, if we can think about silver linings, was that we were able to invite the ceramic artist, uh, Philadelphia-based Roberta Massage, to come and, and have a residency period at the studio during a relatively quiet moment while we were on lockdown. Roberta actually came and took raw clay and pressed it into the crevices of the building to create forms that, that she then uh, painted, fired, brought back here, and uh, are, will be on view until we close for the season in December, really thinking about the way that Eschrich used color strategically, that he was not somebody who, because he was interested in sort of natural forms, natural uh, organic architecture, was not somebody who stayed away from color, but instead saw the color in nature and embraced it. 
Um, and you see these wonderful, colorful moments um, in the window casings around the site. We'll see some of them inside. Um, and certainly as we go through the door into the studio where you have this beautiful blue that sort of invites you in and then these fabulous hand carved handles, you really get a sense of exactly the kind of space that you're walking into. So I am gonna open the door and welcome you in and everyone can follow behind me. Typically, if, uh, on a tour, if you were here with us, we would ask you to come into the space. We would encourage you to just spend some time looking around, uh, taking everything in, getting a sense of um, who this person is through the objects that you see. And so we're actually gonna give you the opportunity to do that as a part of this program. So we'll have a couple moments of silence while we, while we look at the space. As you can probably tell, even from just that brief walkthrough on camera, this is a space that is jam-packed, is filled with Eshrick's work. Um, virtually everything that you see in the space was made by Eshrick. Everything that you see in the space did belong to Eshrick. Our collection uh, you know, is around uh, 3,000 objects, but that doesn't include the vast quantities of ephemera that we have that relate to his life, so it's a really rich um, uh, it's almost as when you come into the studio, it's almost as if he's gone out for a walk and you're just spending time in his space before he returns home and maybe you're gonna have a chat together. Um, I wanna draw your attention to the painting on the wall. This is a portrait of his daughter, Mary, and it gives you a sense of the carving that we were talking about before. Um, we've got the painting inside, which is a lovely painting. I think you would be hard pressed to look at it and say, that is absolutely a painting by Warden Eshrick. Stylistically, like this is individualistic. It, it does have that relationship to his training. However, these frames are um, beautifully carved. They have this sense of life and rhythm to them and they're unique for the period. So, uh, you know, we might think of the sort of wonderful gilded frames of uh, the late teens and the early 20s and then we think of this kind of gilded frame which is very much a departure. So, you know, it seems very clear to see how this might have gotten people very excited and maybe more so than the image contained within it, although he was a lovely painter, a very capable painter. Um, but where his imagination could fly was in other arenas. I'll hand it over to Julie to talk about sure. the coat pace. So Emily talked about how Eshrick was not formally trained as an architect, or he also was not formally trained as a furniture maker or a woodworker. He, he was introduced to furniture making by uh, a gentleman named John Schmidt. John Schmidt had done an apprenticeship in furniture making in Germany. So he was a very classically trained, very skilled cabinet maker. He knew how to square up angles and uh, add decorative elements, hide evidence of joinery, and produce very classic uh, furniture. John immigrated to the United States and uh, went to live with his sister who, who lived just down the road about a mile away. And when John and Wharton were introduced to one another, John taught Eshrick the basics of furniture. And so the two had an enduring relationship. John would work with and for Wharton for many years. And the relationship uh, played out in such a way that John was able to take these visions that Wharton had, unencumbered by all of the things that you learn not to do and all of the narrow ways that you learn to do when you make furniture. Uh, and he would have these, these artistically driven visions for what a piece of furniture could be, how it could be sculptural, how it could be 
um, very different. And John could have the technical and the engineering capability to pull it together. So uh, likewise with the, with the building, um, the building, Wharton used to say that anyone can draw a straight line. It's when you draw a curve, that's when you have to start to think. So there are right angles present in this building, um, but there are fewer and far between than, than most buildings. And there's a lot of beautiful curves, unexpected lines. Uh, and so again, Wharton was just unencumbered by the traditional thinking and the ways of architecture. Uh, so he uh, commemorated the people who helped him build the the studio and the furniture within it with these beautiful coat pegs. On the left here is, is John Schmidt. Uh, I have about going on eight years worth of interpreting this place and it was just last year that I realized uh, that underneath, and I don't know if you'll be able to pick that up, Carrie, but he added these beautiful individual uh, personality pieces to these carved coat pegs. There are saw blades, so John Schmidt is carrying a, a saw in a pair. And I wouldn't stop talking about that for a long time. And he's got his lovely pork pie hat on. The bird that sang to them and kept them company. This is Bert Culp. Albert Culp was a stonemason uh, who you went to to build a uh, watertight solid barn in the area. And Wharton enlisted his help uh, in constructing the studio. And then Bert Culp's two helpers. Aaron Coleman and Larry Hands. Larry Hands was evidently a really big guy with a barrel chest, so he's got that wonderful barrel chest portrayed there. And then there's Wharton uh, up ahead orchestrating the whole show. So he gave credit where credit was due. And we'll go over into the corner of the main gallery and look at some of Escherich's prints. So this collection of prints, uh, which was the next foray into woodworking, um, when Eshrick returned from his trip to Fairhope, he had some commercial and artistic success with printmaking. He was illustrating books um, and producing a lot of prints. We have about 400 woodblocks on site here. Uh, this is a collection from different timelines uh, and different things going on here. What is of interest, though, is this one. This is the print produced from this woodblock. In the process, this might as well be a paintbrush, but Wharton loved these. He would apply the white paint to bring out the detail, and he would hang them here or give them as gifts. He loved the, uh, the effect of, of the woodblock and felt that they were as much a part of the art as the, finished, as the finished print. This is an early piece of furniture, um, the drop leaf desk. This is circa 1927. We refer to it as his journeyman's piece. It's not his first piece of furniture, but it is an early one and one that he completed largely on his own um, after sort of getting the basics of furniture making down. It incorporates a lot of the things that made him a successful furniture maker. Um, but you can see how he's carving decorative narrative into this as if he's still printmaking, whereas his later pieces are distilled down just to, just to form. I think also there's this relief to the carving here, right? You have um, not just the narrative of uh, we've got the, the, the birds ahead, the, the trees that we're looking up into, the fields that are growing, but each of them have this dimensional quality to them that you can almost imagine, although we would never do this <laughs> for many reasons, you can almost imagine inking this and printing it <laughs> yeah. as a block, right? Yeah. It's, it, in some ways, it seems like a, br a block, yeah. uh, a printer's block that's also a piece of furniture. Um, you know, certainly this was an object, and we'll open some, open some doors here that Eshrick designed as an active workspace and to store uh, things related to printing and printmaking in. Um, we've got this wonderful big sort of expansive workspace. Uh, what you're seeing on the shelves and in the drawers, these are Eshrick's personal effects. They're his papers. They're the pencils that he was using, right? So um, you have all of these really remarkable um, uh, so you have a sense of how he used these things in addition to really getting a sense of um, how he was designing them and, and the, the, the styles that he was working within. Um, you'll notice that there are no external pieces of hardware on this desk, Extric. Everything is fully integrated, so you'll see there are grooves here that you can use to pull open. Um, when I, let's get around you here, Pull open the drawers down here, and these are all flat files for prints. Uh, we also store things from our collection in here, so it's actively being used in that way. Um, 
everything is designed so that no hardware, no external additions interrupt the narrative of the surface here. Um, and the piece goes down to the floor. Eshrick was not a fan of wasted space. So you can see that this is a drawer that we can pull out. Uh, he was also not a fan of furniture that you had to clean under. Very practical in addition to being. <laughs> Emily, I have a question about yeah. this, this piece. Is this something Escherich ever intended to show in a gallery setting or to be sold? Or is this really something that he made for himself, for his own use? That's my understanding of it, is that this is, uh, you know, this is for Escherich's own work. This mm -hmm. is something that um, was useful for him and the way he worked, which is one of the really exciting things about some of these pieces of furniture in situ in this space, right? We get a sense of process just through reading the function of the furniture. Right. Um, it's what makes this transition <laughs> to the next <laughs> desk that I'm going to show you so remarkable because the, the desk that we're looking at here, uh, which is his flat top desk, is from just two years later. Uh, in 1929. And so you can see that we have done away with most uh, external ornaments. Certainly pictorial ornament is out the window. <laughs> we have these wonderful uh, carved um, geometric elements that are also the poles to open and close the drawers. Um, I'll ask you to come and take a look here at the carving where we have W.E. his signature, 1929 and 1962. So the blanks for this piece were made in 29. Eschrich had been thinking about geometry. He had spent time in Germany learning from and studying the German Expressionists. Uh, he had been thinking about the Bauhaus. He'd been thinking about modernism in really interesting ways. Um, and when this desk was originally done, it had an aluminum top. And so he was thinking not just about expressing in wood, but also potentially about combining very contemporary materials with wooden elements, um, thinking about what it meant to make modern pieces of furniture, which is certainly this vast pivot <laughs> from uh, a piece like the drop leaf desk. Um, ultimately, he decided that aluminum was far too cold. He preferred the warmth and the liveliness of the wood for the top. We have 1962 as the date for this top because uh, Eschrich would put a top on this desk Clients would come in, they'd take a look at it, they'd say, God, that would make a beautiful table, and he would sell it right off the desk. <laughs> and so it's gone through these various iterations. Um, you really have this big shift in a very short period of time when we move from this kind of organic period into what we think of as, as, as Eschrich's prismatic period where geometry is front and center. We're thinking about pared down forms, and we're thinking about um, an interface with modernity, which is something that I think folks often have this um, understanding of Eschrich as an artist working out in the country, working solely with his hands. He's not thinking about anything modern. He's not thinking about contemporary influences or connections. And that's despite really- Despite the timeline. Despite the timeline. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that's really not the case. He's just filtering it through an Eschrich uh, a mm -hmm. sort of lens which is why it's very hard to sort of think about this in the, in the grand scheme of um, uh, you know, capital M modernism. And yet it's in dialogue with all of that. It, it also was, on, uh, was used in the farmhouse down the hill, which was decorated in a totally different organic style. And so um, I think you really get a sense by looking at archival photographs of this in situ of just how different it was from the prevailing aesthetic in Eschrich's life at the time. We're lucky to have a third desk <laughs> in the studio. And so we can really see how we get these big stylistic shifts over time. There's much bigger jump between the, the flat top desk and uh, the cabinet desk, which is from 1958. This was made as a replacement desk uh, when the drop leaf desk was meant to go on view as a part of Eschrich's major exhibition at the Museum of Arts and Design, then the Museum of Contemporary Craft in New York, where he had the first solo exhibition, uh, major retrospective exhibition for a living artist in the museum's history. Uh, and that was in 59, is that it right? It was in 58-59. And that's, so this piece went there. So, well, so they requested this piece. <laughs> he made this piece as a replacement because he still needed to work. Got it. 
then they requested this piece because they were so taken with it, right? Um, and, and we're looking at something now where we have no extraneous ornament whatsoever, right? We have this um, sort of beautiful, it's almost art deco kind of detailing to the front, the way that it's um, uh, corresponding with the wood grain. Again, we don't have any handles, not, no external hardware. So I love that you can see what's consistent across the career and where the changes are mm -hmm. in the comparison between these three pieces. I open it with this really neat door jam. So at first we're a bit hard pressed to see how this is a desk, right? <laughs> it looks like it looks like a cabinet here. We can see the flat files. We know that Ashrick liked to have that on the desks that he was working with. I'm gonna pull out the desktop here and all of a sudden you have a desk, right? So this is in many ways this kind of very um, uh, modular, uh, uh, it's a piece of furniture that really adapts to contemporary uses. It doesn't have to take up space when you don't need it. You've got all of this remarkable storage in here. Um, the only problem is that the light cannot come onto the top of the desk when you're working because you have these panels here sort of shielding an Escherich uh, there's, a, there's a wonderful article with Eshrick in a Craft Horizons magazine where he talks about not needing to use hand tools, not really needing to um, uh, sort of slavishly adhere to any kinds of doctrines around what didn't or didn't make sense to use in the production of furniture. Um, there he says he would use his teeth if that was the right tool for the job. <laughs> Here we're looking at Eshrick solving the problem of there not being light on the desk by using uh, these kind of wonderful uh, technology from the refrigerator that everyone here has in their house, right? So you open these drawers, the lights come on, all of a sudden you have this remarkable, um, very warm and inviting workspace with tons of storage and room for Eshrick uh, to do his work. There's a degree of simplicity here. We see this sort of wonderful sense of organic line and curvature to, uh, to the top of the desk and the way that he's created these wells for objects that will help him do his work. That sense of simplicity, uh, curvature, is really something that we see throughout the works made towards the latter half of his life. And certainly something that when we think of Eshrick, when we think of something like uh, the library ladder, which is right behind the desk here, and we'll talk about another version of that upstairs, um, we think about that sort of organic simplicity. Emily, could you say something about Escherich's wood choices and how he sourced his wood? Sure, so Escherich, again, um, one of the things I love about him is that he worked with a community of people around him. Escherich was great about knowing what he didn't know and finding the right people to connect with, the right people to work with. And so he had a wood supplier, Ed Ray, um, who would find things for him, find things that he knew other people wouldn't necessarily see the power in, but that Eshrick could take a look at it and say, okay, there's something here, what can I make from it? Because he was looking at it with this kind of um, unconventional eye. Um, Julie, do you wanna talk about some of the, I think we've got great pieces that are connected sure. to Ed Ray in the sculpture well. Sure. So, Ed was a, a logger and a sawyer. He had gone out to the Pacific Northwest and learned all about um, harvesting wood and come back here and been um, doing that in, on this mountain. And after uh, Ed and, and Wharton met and became lifelong friends, Ed became his sole wood supplier. And I think of Ed increasingly as an artistic partner to Wharton. Um, there are pieces in, in this sculpture well um, there's one here that is difficult to capture, I know, Carrie, but um, there, are, there are pieces that have extremely, where extremely odd curvature. So another woodworker would look at them and say, well, that's too difficult. I can't get a board out of that, or um, that's just not, I need something that is straighter that I can manipulate into the shape that I want, where Wharton would look at it and say, ah, that's, that's it. I, I can pull that out of there. And Ed would know that about him. So he would take a log that had a, a odd, weird, 
curvature to it and give it to Wharton knowing that he was the person to bring something out of it. Ed would drop by in the evenings and say, there's 20 feet of spalted maple in your woodshed that I just want you to have because it has a spectacular grain pattern. And Ed couldn't bear the thought of some other woodworker making some banal, boring thing out of it. He wanted Wharton to really bring that green pattern to, to life out of it. The staircase, I don't know if you can get a good image of it, we can move a little bit closer to it, but the staircase, which is a really iconic usher piece uh, done in uh, 1930, the staircase, the column, the central column uh, makes the piece. It allows the spiral to happen so the treads can follow the different faces up it. Ed had to basically take an order from Escherich <laughs> to go out into nature and to find uh, a log that, that he could uh, tease out the, the shape of those faces as they twisted up through that column. So they worked together really nicely um, and would would follow one another's lead to find just the right piece of material. But largely the material came from right through those windows. <laughs> While we're here at the sculpture well, uh, would one of you like to talk about Escherich's inspirations for his sculpture and how he approached sculpting and that process? It's my take that, that um, when it came to sculptural work, that's when Escherich was free of the constraints of commissions. Mm -hmm. um, I see a lot of joy. This is my personal take. I see a lot of joy. Um, and Wharton had a motto was, if it's not fun, it's not doing. Um, I do, it, it's very easy to look at his sculptural work and see the influence. Um, you see Matisse, you see Brancusi, this piece here, um, in the middle, spiral pull was done in direct response to Brancusi's infinite column. Escherich thought he got it wrong. He didn't graduate the sections as they went up, so he made a wooden version that he thought took it to the next level. Um, but he was a ferocious reader and a consumer of other artists. And um, there's a story about him being invited to Albert Barnes's uh, locale in uh, Marion, and Albert Barnes was going to talk about art to a bunch of artists and. Uh, Wharton was hesitant to sit down and listen. He wanted to look, and I think there was some tension between the two. Um, so, you know, he, he wanted to take in as much of other artists as he could. And of course, that's, that's the way it happens. That's, mm -hmm. that's what art history is. And we see that with, with Wharton as well. You want to weigh in, Emily? Yeah, I'll also yeah. mention here that, that um, you know, Eschrich was not just operating within uh, sort of art and design milieus. He was connected to the literary world through his work with Centaur Bookshop. He was connected to the Hedgerow Theater in Rose Valley, the arts and crafts community. Um, he was designing uh, furniture for their, their, for the theater for, he was designing things for the stage. He was connecting writers to them. And, and so we actually see in some of the sculpture here, um, inspiration that he's taken from the theater, inspiration that he's taken from watching actors and dancers. He would spend time going up to a uh, uh, sort of uh, eurythmic dance camp with his family um, uh, in, in New York to, to sort of, uh, the, his Letty would, and the daughters would, would learn the dances and he would spend his time sketching the, um, uh, the dancers in motion. And so I think you get a sense of that real interest in um, how do you take the written word and make it form? How do you take dance and make it form? How do you take the emotion of theater and make it form um, when you're looking at his sculptural works? And I think the answer is right in front of yes. us. Yes. <laughs> we can spend a little bit more time talking about um, the spiral circus because this is, of course, such a highlight <laughs> of any visit to, to the museum. It's um, an incredibly unique piece. Again, built in 1930, has actually left the studio two times, which seems almost impossible when you think about how beautifully integrated it is into the environment here. The first was in 1939, 1940, Escherich was asked by the Philadelphia architect, George Howe, to design a, a Pennsylvania Hill House for his exhibition, America at Home, which looked at artists, architects, uh, sort of visions for um, what an American aesthetic future could look like. And here, marrying this um, uh, sort of materials that really give you a sense of history in the past with the wood, with um, the Escherich's signature sort of modern outlook 
It then left the studio again in 1958 to be a part of that retrospective at the Museum of Contemporary Crafts. So um, this sort of wonderful key feature of uh, big moments in Escherich's career. Um, Julie, do you wanna, are you gonna head up? Yeah, we'll take, a, we'll take a quick look yeah. in the bedroom. Oh, great. And then we'll do a, a, a quick look in the dining room kitchen uh, and finish with a few more. Great. All right. is the decidedly uh, private space, so the public, private, modern home idea. Uh, I'll show you one of Eshrick's clever solutions for wardrobe storage. That's always, uh, that's always great to see. This is a, a, just an example of how he was a great problem solver when it came to utilizing small spaces um, in a way that was efficient. All of these drawers go the length of the, the entire bed. And these are his original clothes. Certainly we get a sense of him in this space from the books that surround us, from um, the photographs, from uh, collections objects. We have his whole library, which is wonderful to think about how, what we can learn about him through what we can uh, uh, see of what he was reading. Um, we have a beautiful version of the library ladder here from the late 1960s. This is perhaps Escherich's best known design and was done right at the end of his life. So really somebody who's creative up until the end. And now that you've seen the spiral staircase, I want you to take a look at the central column here. He's still using that same exact twist, that spiral of the spiral staircase as the sort of central feature for the library ladder. So it, again, those callbacks throughout his career. Tim's gonna operate another uh, problem solving uh, idea that Ezra had that, that we always enjoy, which is the employment of a trapdoor. He wanted to keep sawdust out and warmth in in this personal space that served as his bedroom. So he created a trapdoor here. You could close it with a handle on your way down in the morning and close it up tight in the evening. Pretty neat. <laughs> and of course, with a sense of humor to the whole yes, as well. Always. <laughs> the counterweight is an homage to his twin sister, Dottie, who he said was always hanging around. <laughs> so we'll head uh, back down and into the dining room kitchen to complete the tour of the studio. is the addition that Escher puts on in 1966, that beautifully uh, painted space, that silo space that Emily pointed to. Um, it's a kitchen down below and upstairs is a second bathroom and some uh, dressing space, closet space. It's a very efficient kitchen. Um, a lot of people come in and want to go home and revamp their kitchen after they've been in here, rethink it. It's uh, a place where he puts color. He puts this beautiful uh, grass green on the ceiling. The studio is very brown. It's monochromatic because it's made out of wood, woodish, different shades of brown. But here he uh, he incorporates this bright green. He does a lot of um, design elements that are considered in kitchen design now. And he's way ahead of the curve of this. If you design a kitchen now, it's going to come with one of these sink inserts to help you with drainage and chopping. He does this um, with his hand-carved uh, tray in his hand-hammered copper sink. 
He pops a light in this cupboard and puts more color inside so you're not fumbling around looking for your Tupperware lids. It's all of these little considerations that make this kitchen so efficient, so easy to use, even though it's so tiny. Um, Eshrick sailed as a kid. That was a, a major activity in his childhood. Uh, his honeymoon was a sail at Barnegat Bay. Sailing was a big part of his life. It was something he romanticized and internalized, and it came out in his work a lot. And if you look through this window in this space, this is very much a ship's galley kitchen. He puts these lips on these shelves, um, and he, it's coming out in, in the design of this, of this kitchen and this wonderful, efficient space in here. Emily has um, a drawer to show you over here that also yep. so incorporates again, beautiful use of space. Yeah, more efficient use of space here. This sort of single hinge drawer that allows for this incredible deep storage, despite there not being any right angles to, to be found. Again, as we said before, we're looking at curves <laughs> as we go through the space, uh, not right angles for the most part. I think that's certainly true in the dining room if we head in there where we have um, you know, his, his wonderful table here, which um, uh, is connected to the wall because, uh, again, Eshrick was trying to make a living and he would let things go to clients and he didn't want this final table to run away from him. <laughs> um, and then we've got the floor, which is really unlike any, um, any wooden floor, I think, anywhere. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> Where, again, he's working with um, uh, really exciting and special wood supplied to him by Ed Ray. Um, here, sort of scraps that were thought to be unusable to make this remarkable mosaic of, of form and color and, and pattern in the wood. Ed Ray's response to the use of these free scraps um, was to tell Warden that he was not getting free scraps anymore. <laughs> this is all applewood and walnut yes. that he has spline and groove. So, and you can tell just by the shine on it how much how much time and attention was given to the finish. This mm -hmm. is you're walking through your kitchen at home. You you want to be comfortable. You're likely to be barefoot. So he's given the uh, the finish of this. Uh, so much, so much care, and it really does feel like satin. He plays with texture in this mm -hmm. uh, in this room. You can see on the walls that uh, he's run the boards through a planer just enough to take away the threat of splinters, but but left the mill marks, the blade marks on on the boards, and that gives it that beauty and also that tactile interest. And then the ceiling boards, um, they're almost rough boards. He's just sort of shiplap them up there and left them left them that's that's a time saver you can get on to the next artwork so you know here he's he's given us this textural evolution from the floor to the ceiling literally enveloped himself in wood this is 1940 he's finding his stride as a furniture maker as a woodworker um, he's obviously in love with the medium he is and and where he, where there are pieces that are not wood here it's evidence of his close relationships with colleagues with other artists in the field so the, the plates on the wall, the ceramic plates on the wall, for example, are done by Henry Warren Poor, who was a close friend. They include um, portraits of Eshrick's family and uh, his daughters, uh, his son Pete has that, we've got that great Pete uh, <laughs> <laughs> graphic, so graphic done up there. And then, and then uh, maybe before we head outside, we can come back and take a look quickly at this, at, at Henry Warren Poor's uh, portrait of Eshrick himself. So you've both mentioned Eshrick's family, um, and I think of this space as being a very personal one to him. Um, can you talk about that relationship between Sunnycrest and the studio and where Eshrick was and where his family was sort of residing? Yeah, I think there was there was a, a sort of distinct <laughs> separation <laughs> between work and home that Eshrick cultivated by having the studio. And of course, when the studio was first built, Eshrick was not living in this space. Um, it was a space for work. Later, he lived here with his son, Peter. Um, and later, even sort of towards the end of his life, he lived there with his partner, Miriam Phillips. So um, I think home and family were a complicated mm -hmm. and um, uh, uh, sort of interesting mix for Eshrick, but having these two spaces um, in such close proximity to each other allowed for some flow back and forth between, between the sites. And certainly, um, when we tell the story of Eshrick, 
you know, we do it here when you come to visit us just in this studio space. It's very hard to tell the story yes. of Ashwick without talking about the broader campus, which has a number of different buildings on it. And we can go take yes. a look outside on the porch. And we'll tell you more about what, what our future interpretive capabilities will be. So if the leaves were off the trees, we would actually be able to see the farmhouse, which the Eshricks called Sunnycrest, right from where we are now. Um, such as it is, the leaf coverage disallows that. But this rendering, we had finished a master campus planning project on March 11th, 2020. <laughs> two days later, we uh, locked up the studio for what we thought would be two weeks, um, which turned out to be quite a lot longer. But <clears throat> What you're looking at here is a rendering that was a product of that campus planning process. And it shows, we have a 12 acre campus here, and it shows how we intend to utilize the full resources of the campus to tell the full story so we can answer the question uh, that Tim just asked. So we're here now. Um, just to your right is the 1956 workshop. Um, when Eshrick began living in the studio and using as his um, home and workspace, he quickly outgrew it as his commissions came in and necessitated larger and larger pieces, staircases, um, entire architectural spaces, even designed a couple of homes. Uh, he outgrew the space quickly. So in 1955, he began the conceptual work on that building, which is co designed with. By that point, your different township where we are necessitated drawings and architectural um, architectural drawings and permits, which is why he worked with Lucan on that. When the rest of the studio was built, it was sort of the wild west of doing whatever you wanted, <laughs> and that's why that's why Wharton got right. away with the building that we've just toured through. Um, so this upper campus where we are now will be connected via uh, a trail that and will switch back to negate the grade. And I'll just note that the 56 workshop has not been available to the public Correct. since Eshrick's passing. It's been a private residence. Um, Eshrick's son-in-law, Bob Baskin, who was the founder of the co-founder of the museum, lived there until his passing. Um, and so we're so excited to have this remarkable building, this very unconventional con building, um, this building that tells the story of an architect like Ann Ting, who mm -hmm. has not been given her due. Right. Um, and also tells the story of how Eshrick worked uh, when he was making these larger scale pieces, the pieces that in some ways he's best known for. And we do have tools. And we have tools. We have the bandsaw uh, that John Schmidt made for him out of bicycle tires, <laughs> a very DIY kind of approach. Um, that has, has not been available as usable museum space and we are very excited to think about the possibilities for bringing that to uh, the audiences who come here to view them, this expanded experience of Escher. Emily, before we started, you were mentioning all these exciting finds that yes. you guys have uncovered <laughs> in recent months and, and years. Would you like to touch upon a few of those? Sure. So in the process of going through the workshop, once it became available to us, we found some fantastic archival documents, about five boxes worth, that detail um, and answer a lot of questions for us about Eshrick in his own words. Um, my personal favorite things that, that we found include his whole file um, from his experience uh, speaking at and attending the American Craft Council's early conference at Asilomar, uh, which is just wonderful to, to be able to read in his own words what he thought of that experience, how he prepared for it. Buying um, the airline tickets. Buying that airline. was the whole thing. We've got the mundane <laughs> to the ridiculous in these files. We do, we um, do. <laughs> but also, uh, you know, we have a copy of his, we have his passport, uh, which allows mm -hmm. us to answer this question, this very simple question that people have been asking as long as they've been touring the studio, which is how tall Eshrick was. Um, now we know, <laughs> six feet, we can give you the answer. Letters between <laughs> clients conceiving of and giving us a timeline of the production of pieces. Mm -hmm. um, letters between clients demanding payment 
Yes. <laughs> I mean, you know, it, it, it fleshes out these stories of the relationships that he often built between himself and people yes. who fell in love with his work and became rabid collectors of it. And that personalizes and just brings out these stories that we knew were part of it, but but we, you know, to really read those words yeah. in, in the penmanship is just... To have thrilling. the documentation is yeah. different. And also these, you know, we've known about Eshrick's connections with, with many artists you know, now we have the receipt from and the letter from when Lenore Tawney visited the studio oh, and purchased wow. pieces. Um, we have correspondence between Eshrick and uh, the Wilton Haynes, who were lifelong friends, right? So mm -hmm. to have those things, we're getting this fuller picture of Eshrick within the landscape of um, so many different milieus that he operated in. And certainly Eshrick is somebody whose narrative uh, uh, is interesting in all of those values. Yes, very. So, so there's there's interesting things to say about his yeah. friendships, about his other relationships, about his client relationships. Um, so we're really excited to do work on that and share it with with folks once it's once it's ready to be seen. Sounds like the making of a fascinating book. Too. You know, <laughs> <laughs> we've, got, we've got many books in this site. So <laughs> I think one of the things that allows us to be um, thinking about the resources that we have here and thinking about our next steps, our sort of future dreams for them yeah. is a pretty remarkable gift that we received. Uh, well, we guess we, we received about this time last year. We, yes, made the <laughs> we made the announcement this past winter, which is um, a, an incredibly generous $10 million endowment gift from the Wingate Foundations, which is again, provided us with a, an amazing platform to think big about um, what this organization can be. Mm -hmm. Yes, that relationship uh, goes back about 25 years. And uh, I think what, what they saw was a readiness in this organization to, to move beyond. Um, we, in, in our 50 year history, next year is our 50th anniversary. Um, it had been really one program, which was to open the door welcome you through, give you a tour, and then that was sort of it. Uh, there was no programmatic space. There was no space to reflect on what you had just experienced. We had no gathering space. Um, we had no office space. We couldn't grow our staff even if we wanted to unless we sat out in the driveway. So <laughs> it really uh, was time for us to start making connections, making connections with the global community of artists, of scholars, of museum peers, who are, are ready for us to uh, take these assets and ones that we have just found and ones that were extant and start to connect the dots. Uh, because as I said, when we started the tour, Wharton's contributions to the fields of art history, design, architecture are much, much bigger than he often gets pigeonholed about. Yes. Yep. Um, so we're ready. Um, and I think they, <laughs> they saw that it was time. Um, we have been working with a communications firm um, around uh, a number of things, including our, our gift announcement, because it came at a bittersweet time. There were a lot of organizations that were struggling. Um, and they've helped us build some, some language and some messaging. And one of the things that we keep coming back to that they so brilliantly helped us phrase was working with a family-run organization, a legacy organization of any kind, is both wonderful and it can be frustrating. Uh, because the family is always very large presence there. Mm -hmm. um, and they have, have given us this wonderful analogy of a telescope. So your family run organization is always gonna see things most closely. And as that uh, broadens out and your staff is less closely associated, you're gonna have an easier time of being able to, to contextualize and connect those pieces and I think that's where we are and what they saw and ultimately what that means is more opportunities for you guys mm -hmm. absolutely <laughs> of the, yeah, of the absolutely decorative arts society to come yeah. and yeah. learn through our our site through the mm -hmm. programs that we do we have wonderful um, virtual programs and talks that are yeah. up on our website and we just would love to invite you in to, <laughs> to everything we're doing you're an organization during the past year where so many have struggled that have taken this opportunity <laughs> to really increase visibility and awareness. And so your uh, virtual platform is really incredible. So I encourage you all to take advantage of the opportunity to see what you have online. 
But I guess on the opposite end of the spectrum, mm -hmm. you've continued sort of the, the tangible nature of Eshkerith's work with your 27th annual uh, juried exhibition of working yes. in the woods. Could you touch on that yeah. initiative a bit? And yes, how absolutely. Eshrick's legacy. Sure. Well, I will say, you know, as much as we encourage you to get on our virtual spaces, there really is no substitute for coming here. Right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> tangible uh, experience with Eshrick's work is something that can't be um, <laughs> replicated online. Um, we do want to bring. Uh, artists who are working today into the conversation with Eshrick because we find that there are so many points of confluence and that Eshrick's legacy leaves a lot of a jumping off platform for artists who are doing work right now. So we have a long-standing program of a juried woodworking exhibition where we typically take a theme that's present in some aspect of Eshrick's life. Um, it might be a form now we're, we're sort of thinking a little bit more thematically with it and we ask artists who are working in wood in some way does not have to be as sort of um, traditional woodworkers certainly the exhibition this year does not only feature traditional woodworkers um, we ask them for their take on it to sort of look at how Eshrick's theme is present in their own work and so for this year um, our, our theme was wood and. Eshrick is so much about material combination. Even though we might think of him, him only as working in wood, um, we're looking at material combinations in single objects. We're also looking at the material combinations in the site writ large. And so uh, we received over 130 <laughs> entries from contemporary artists from diverse fields, many from woodworking and sculpture, but also uh, painters, we had textile folks who are all thinking Architects. about architects, mm -hmm. exactly, We're all, who are all thinking about combining wood with another medium and, and thinking through how they talk to one another and the possibilities that are um, inherent there. And so we have on um, site in our very small visitor center, which used to be Eshrick's garage. So it uh, gives you a, a sense of the square footage there. We're talking about 150 square feet for all of the operations there, including the gallery space. Um, the, the three works that came in were juried into the first three top prizes. And uh, that show was juried by myself, along with Miguel Gomez Ibanez, who is the president emeritus of the North Bennett Street School in Boston, and Samantha Dottilio, who is a collections curator at the Museum of Arts and Design. So coming from really different and interesting perspectives. All 26 of the works that were juried in are online. You can take a look, you can learn about the artists, you can spend some time with them. They range really broadly. Um, uh, they're also available for sale if you're so inclined. <laughs> um, we also have a wonderful catalog that you can order on the website, some video materials, um, including our third place winner, Christian Burchard, who's a very well-known uh, uh, sculptor, has works in lots of major museum collections, uh, took the opportunity to enter this show with a sort of personal side uh, work that he does, which is to take some of his cast off turned objects and turn them into remarkably uh, beautiful ver uh, contemporary versions of traditional African uh, here Malian instruments. And so we have some wonderful uh, footage of Christian playing his riffs, riff on a Donso Nagoni. So you can take a look at that there as well, and I hope that you will. Tim, before we go, I mean, Eshrick isn't perhaps a household name, but he's a hugely collectible figure in the world of 20th century craft and design. For our viewers who aren't able to get here to the Eshrick Museum, who aren't around the corner or a stone's throw, <laughs> and we hope you'll make a special trip here to Paoli at some point, where could they go to see a museum collection that might feature Eshrick's work? That's a good question, and there are a number of good spots. Probably the one that some of the viewers might be most familiar with is at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, which at the time the Curtis Bach House was dismantled, I believe it was in Gulf Mills, Pennsylvania. Curtis Bach was a Supreme Court Justice and a patron of Escherich's, uh, for whom he did an incredible fireplace surround, staircase, uh, doorway. Uh, the, it's the doorway and the and the fireplace surround that viewers can see at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And there are also fabulous pieces at the uh, Museum of Fine Arts Boston. Mm -hmm. There was a fabulous program you all put on with Nani Gadsden yeah. at the MFA speaking about that fabulous 
Macro screen that they have. A very there. early screen that's from around the same time as the Drop Leaf Desk, and that program is also up on our website. I'll also encourage you, um, our on our website, our online resources for educators page has a full list linked out to where you can find ASHRIC in, con in museums around the country. What I find most fascinating is someone who used to pretend to be a furniture historian. <laughs> when we look at 18th century, 19th century work, um, cabinet makers were not inclined to often mark their wares, mm. but it seems like Eshrick took the chance to mark whatever came through his shop. Do you all have any thoughts on what, or does that say anything about him as a person? Does it reflect his background as a fine artist? Uh, an arena where it's more traditional for, to perhaps sign your work? Um, any thoughts on that front? Uh, Hmm. It's a good question, and it changes over time. Right. I Mark. always felt like his mm -hmm. signature changed depending upon the medium or the style that he was working yes. in yeah. at the time, whether it's in the teens and 20s, and then yeah. moving to the sort of like more organic yep. signature in the 50s and 60s. I think ultimately Eshrick wasn't bogged down by tradition, you know, knowing that that is the history, historical way that, for, you know, that that's not part of furniture's tradition didn't bother him, right? Yeah. He's, he's Eshrick. He wants yeah. you to know that what he makes it is Eshrick. It's either going to tell you that through the signature or it's going to tell you that through the object itself. And most often, through the object itself, you don't have to look at a signature to know that what you're looking at is an Eshrick. He also uh, made a point of, of wanting to be called, referred to, and self-identify as an artist yes. over a furniture maker, woodworker, or, or any other moniker. So that... Prob it probably was as much signing uh, as you would a painting yes. as it, it was signing a chair. Uh, the the authorship of an artist yes. sort of translates yes. <laughs> to, to the way that he's thinking about the, yeah. the work he's making. And there's this fabulous yeah. recent documentary that mm -hmm. sort of uses that as its as its title. I am known as an artist. The documentary by the she's based in California, right? Yeah. Carolyn yeah. Cole. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which I would encourage viewers to purchase a copy of. It's a really wonderful yeah. way, I think, to see and hear about Escherich's work as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, we're grateful for the Escherich Museum team for hosting us today and to our friends at Freeman's for sponsoring the tour. Um, you know, uh, Escherich's motto of if it isn't fun, it isn't worth doing is just fabulous. And I'm sure Carrie has beautifully captured the fun of seeing this <laughs> intimate and immersive experience. and. Uh, it's no substitute for being here in person, so please do come to visit uh, when you can. Uh, the museum is ex about to expand its tour offerings for in-person visitation, which suggests the excitement and desire to get here and to see Eshrick's life and legacy here on a first-hand basis. Um, next, or later this month, actually, we're going to retreat from this foray into the 20th century back to the safer confines <laughs> of the 18th century, where many of you like to reside with a special end of summer tour with Ralph Harvard at Sabin Hall, an extraordinary 18th century Virginia house. Uh, Ralph also would uh, eschew uh, Eshrick's motto of if it isn't fun, it isn't worth doing. So I know you all will enjoy that. And thank you all so much for this uh, incredible opportunity. We're, we're truly grateful. Well, thank you for spending time with us. Yes. I really enjoyed having you. Indeed.